Welcome to session 16 of uh, our Revelation study. So, I have given you pages 125 through 137, which cover chapter 11 of the Revelation. So, let's start by praying, and then we'll read uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, we ask you to open these things up. Lord, there'll be several wonderful principles that we'll be able to look at and enjoy. I ask you to open our ears so that this will be clear and plain. Father, I pray that uh, what I'll be able to say and share will be interesting. And Lord, it'll, uh, it'll just be opened to us. And you'll make these things applicable into our lives so that we'll be able to understand this wonderful book and be blessed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, verse 1 on page 125 of chapter 11 says... And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Uh, let's make sure now, in what city was uh, the temple? Jerusalem. Good. Verse 2. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they, the Gentiles, tread underfoot forty and two months. Um, now, so what city will be tread underfoot? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And how long is forty-two months? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Very good. Very good. So Jesus has already talked about this. Uh, he's already given us insight into things that he'd already said in the book of Luke chapter 21. So if you'll drop down to where I have you, Luke 21, 24 there. It reads, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Um, now let me show you right here real quick, and then it'll, it'll, we won't have to do all of this, but I'll just show you real quickly what Jesus is here speaking about in Luke 21 and what John is also um, echoing uh, Jesus saying and what the book of Revelation is speaking about in chapter 11. Uh, the verse we just read chapter, in chapter 21 of Luke, verse 24 uh, is, is talking here about what Jesus said. It'll be that Jerusalem will be trodden under the feet of the Gentiles. And then just a few verses later after that, down in, in Luke uh, 21, 32, here's what it says. It says, uh, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, verse 33, but my words shall not pass away. So Jesus assures us that this would happen to what generation? That generation, not our generation. So what John is talking about here is some, not something that's, that's going to be happening, you know, 2,000 years down the road or at some distant time. What John's talking about here is the same thing that Jesus was talking about. He's parroting, echoing, uh, carbon copying what Jesus said. Jesus assures us, he says, heaven and earth can pass away, but this is going to happen. <laughs> you know, count on it. Now, the NIV Bible brings out a, uh, a very interesting thought here on that verse. Uh, so back on page 125, come all the way down on the left column where I have Revelation 11, 1 again. This time, though, it's in the NIV version. It says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told. Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count, count the worshipers there. Now, John was in the, in the King James Version, it says measure the worshipers, but here it says count the worshipers there. So what, what's happening here is, is that he is counting or measuring the true worshipers or the worshipers that aren't in, on the outside in the outer court area but the worshipers that are in the inside. 
And this altar that he's talking about here where he says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and told to go and measure the temple and the altar. What that altar that he's talking about is not that outer court altar. It's not the brazen altar. What altar then would it be if there's in the temple? Altar of incense, right? The one on the, on the inner part. It's the holy place altar. It's the altar that's in, in that holy place. Now we've looked at the tabernacle before and I, it, the temple was, was set up under the same design. The, the temple was set up with an outer court area. There was this huge brazen altar on the outside, this huge labor bowl on the outside. And then, of course, you would go inside into the holy place. And this is, this is what, what we're talking about here is, is entering in to the holy place. And, and I've told you before, there were three articles of a furniture in the holy place. On the left side was the candlestick. On the right side was the shoe bread table. And just before the uh, veil, just before it, stood the, this altar that John's told to measure. This is the altar he's told to measure, the altar of incense. This is the altar of worship, the altar of prayer, the altar of, of lifting the prayers and the incense to God. And this is what John is being told here to measure. And it stood just before the veil. And this is the altar that he's now able to see. And what was just behind the veil? Anybody remember? Just behind the veil. The Ark of the Covenant. Now, he's not told to measure the Ark. He's told to measure, he's told to measure the the altar, and it would be the altar of incense. Could other people go to that, that altar? Pardon? No, the only person that was able to go to this altar at this time. Now, this, you're, you're right on what this chapter is about. What, what, what's going to happen here is, is that all of a sudden, rather than just being the Levitical priest, this thing is going to be opened up to us all, Jews and Gentiles. And that's what this chapter is basically about. And we'll... And, at this time, right, that the temple was still standing. And at this time, the only person that could go behind the veil was the high priest. And he could only do it once a year. And it was for the atonement of sins. He would take the blood of animals and sprinkle it seven times on the altar and seven times on the Ark of the Covenant. You know, but only he could go back there. And it, was, it wasn't for the forgiveness of sin. It was for the covering of sin, right? And it wasn't so that sin would be forgiven and forgotten. It would be that they would be always reminded every year over and over and over again about their sin. <laughs> you know, so, so this is, this is, though, is what John is, is here measuring is this, is this altar of, uh, of incense. And, and then, of course, you got the veil, and then you got the Ark of the Covenant back there. Okay. On uh, page, back to page 125. <clears throat> right column. Uh, let's read verse 2 in that right column. Revelation 11, 2. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city. Shall they tread underfoot forty in two months, or three and a half years. Now, what I want to do is I want to read for us, if you will, down on the, the bottom left uh, column, all the way to the back, bottom, the, the last paragraph that begins with, in the Old Covenant. Let me read that to you. In the Old Covenant, the outer court was reserved for the congregation. Only the priests went into the holy place to minister. The Lord was now changing that order. True worshipers move into a new dimension. Today's worship is in spirit and in truth, John 4, 23 and 24. The Lord is finished with animal sacrifices and outer court worship. That worship system was tread underfoot in AD 70. Though contemporary teaching says the Lord, say the Lord, teachings say the Lord will rebuild the temple and reinstate animal sacrifice, this cannot be. The dimension in which Jesus instructs us to worship is in spirit and in truth. Returning to animal sacrifice is anti-scriptural. <laughs> I like the way I did that. It's anti-scriptural. <laughs> Page 126, come down please and let's, let's keep reading. Uh, where the, on the paragraph that begins with no longer, left column, right under that quote. No longer is the natural Jew numbered with the numbered people of God through natural birth. Do you, do you know what I'm trying to say here? Um, no longer can you be, can you access God through just natural birth being a Jew, a seed of Abraham. 
No longer does that work. They must enter into a new inner court worship. The old form of worship, outer court, was destroyed by the Gentiles when they did tread underfoot the city of Jerusalem. There is no question as to what John is here referring. He is not referring to some event that will happen thousands of years later. He is preaching exactly what the Lord preached. Jesus clearly told the people that Jerusalem would be destroyed exactly as Jesus said it would be. It would happen to the generation he spoke. It did happen, according to Luke 21, 24 through 32. Now, um, read that verse with me, Luke 21, 24, one more time. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive and all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, historically, did that happen? Sure, we know it did. I keep popping him, I'll move up just a little bit. Historically, we know that that happened. So we can't discount that. We can't just throw that away. Uh, John gave a prophetic time that the holy city would be tread underfoot. He said 42 months. And again, how long is that? Three and a half years. years. Now, three and a half years is half of seven years. Is, Is that it's not a real revelation there. It's pretty close, huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, do you know, interestingly, of all the sevens in the book of Revelation, and there are 54 of them, <laughs> 54 times seven is used. The number seven is mentioned in the book of Revelation. Not one of them, not one seven, ever mentions seven years. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> Of the 54 mentions of the number seven in the book of Revelation, not one of them is seven years. Now, why is that relevant? The dispensationalists build a big case around seven years. But yet the book of Revelation never speaks of seven years. The book of Revelation never speaks of the Antichrist. Okay, Uh, right uh, column on page 126, uh, come down halfway to the paragraph that begins with this 40 and two months. Let me read that to you. This 40 and two months is prophetic language, speaking of a broken seven. It must also be stated that the Roman army actually did tread underfoot 40 and two months, three and a half years, the city of Jerusalem. The siege itself lasted over a year. Titus, the son of Vespasian, the emperor, sieged the city shortly after his father became emperor. After the destruction of Jerusalem and destruction of the entire region, Titus left the command of the Roman army to to this guy. Three and a half years or 40 and two months would be a very accurate amount of time for the city to to have be tread underfoot by the Gentiles. And that's proven, of course, by history. Drop down to uh, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, the 11th chapter is, is, is interestingly connected with inner worship, and these two witnesses, and the temple. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, how many, how long is a thousand three hundred and, and three and a half years? (laughs) That's exactly right, it's 42 months. (laughs) You see a link here? Do you see a link here? What's, what's happening? You know, this is, so he says it 42 months and he says all these days. And so we're, we're talking here about this. Hello. <laughs> so we're talking here about the, like the same time frame, basically. You know, we're, we're talking about the transitional time from the old covenant to the new covenant is basically the time that we're, that we're basically talking about here. When the temple came down. And so... Uh, They'll, they'll, they'll do this 200 and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. Now, let me, let me go back and make sure that I'll get the point across to you that I'm trying to make here. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And then in verse four, he says, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Okay, now, are, are these two people or are these two trees? Or are these two candlesticks? 
and two witnesses. Are we two people or two things or six people or six things? or? Here's my point. My point is don't get hung up on two people. It never says two people. It says two witnesses. It says two trees. It says two candlesticks. So my point is just don't get hung up on two people. And I think that's what we've done. We're looking for two people to come and be this witness. Uh, turn over to page 127, and let's read verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, now where was our Lord crucified? Somebody? Where? where? Do you, do, Jerusalem? Jerusalem? Well, John, John says it's Sodom and Egypt. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> the point is, Sodom, I mean, it's, the point is, Jerusalem equals Sodom and Egypt. You, 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 you see in this? Jerusalem equals Sodom and Egypt. Jerusalem is Sodom and Egypt. In other words, what happened to Sodom and what happened to Egypt is going to happen to Jerusalem. <laughs> A lot of plagues. Tough time. Definite judgment of God. Right? So this is, this is what John is, is here wanting us to see. This time frame. He is... This is going to happen in this, in, this, in this time frame, in this time of transition from the old to the new to the bringing down of the temple, the time of the Gentiles are trodden at under feet. But yet, and still, we've still got this inner worship. You know, we've still got this altar of incense, and, and there's, a, there's a pure worship. There's, a, there's not an outer court worship where there's blood. Uh, there's not an outer court of worship where you've got to bring animals and blood and sacrifice and kill them out there and all that stuff. You leave all that in the outer court. In the inner court, it's incense. It's clean. It's pure. It's holy. It's something lifting to God. And this is, this is the emphasis of, of what, he's, what he's working with us here. Uh, on the, now drop down with me, please. And, and you do say, I'm, I'm skipping some, but you, you guys can read. I'm just kind of hitting the, the high points. And you can go back and pick up what, I've, <clears throat> what I'm uh, not reading. Uh, so who are the two witnesses? Um, so every, every person who's ever attempted to interpret this book or teach this book uh, have come up with somebody. They, they come face to face with this problem. Who then are these witnesses? Um, who, who are some people maybe that you've heard or some witnesses maybe that you've heard? Elijah. Elijah Moses. Yeah. There you go. John the Baptist. Okay. Uh, Apostle John. Peter. John and Paul. Peter and Paul. <laughs> and Mary. I mean, no, I'm sorry. But, you know, there, there's, this, there's these people that, that are supposed to be the, the witnesses. Uh, uh, how about, uh, let's add in there, Marty and Daryl. How about? <laughs> how about me and Troy? You know, that work, you know? Uh, you, I, mean, I mean, throw it in there. I mean, it, I mean <laughs> and that's kind of what they've done. You know, they just throw these names in there. And somehow they, they, they justify their theology, but they never come up with some kind of reasoning behind it. They never died, so Elijah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, they get all these things, you know. Or Jesus and Moses, you know, I've heard, I've heard of that one, you know. Well, anyhow, but let's, let's look at just a little bit. Uh, read with me on the bottom of 127, left column, beginning at the very last paragraph, where it says there a key thought. A key thought is there are two witnesses, not necessarily two people. They are two olive trees that prophesy, not two prophets. They are two candlesticks, not two people. Now, what we will see, what we're going to see here, what I want you to, to attempt to see with me, is that these two witnesses are the prophets of the Old Testament and the prophets of the New Testament. These are what witnessed against Jerusalem or Judaism. 
these are what witnessed against this. Um, Moses was the first Old Testament prophet. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. So sort of by looking at those two, we kind of can summarize, and in, 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 in no way do you get all of it, but, but we can kind of get the, the thrust of what, uh, what we need to get. Let me ask you a question. Um, the law uh, was, was what Moses wrote a testimony for, or was it a testimony against Israel? The law, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, the, the tables of stone, was it a testimony that was for Israel, or was it against them? It was against, wasn't it? Now say, but we don't realize that. Let me show you this and drop down to Deuteronomy 31, 26. And, and, you know, you need to try to remember this one. It says, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Now, this is Moses speaking. Put it in the side of the covenant of the, of the Lord, your God, that it may be there for a witness. A what? A witness. And, and uh, these are two what? Two witnesses that are in the street that it may be for a witness against thee. Oh, my. <laughs> See, and, and the Old Testament prophets, I mean, you read, look at any one of them, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, every one of them prophesied against Israel and against this, the way they did stuff. So let me read now uh, that paragraph under that verse. Nearly every prophet spoke of the day of the Lord. And the day when the Lord would turn from Jerusalem. These prophets were literally killed in the streets of Jerusalem. Finally, John the Baptist arrived. John summed up all the previous prophets and was the culmination of the Old Testament prophetic message. John's cry and prophetic message was to natural Israel only. You know what I'm saying? Uh, John didn't prophesy to the Gentiles. He didn't minister to the Gentiles. He ministered strictly to, to, to Israel. John did not minister to the Gentiles, Acts 13, 24. John the Baptist told Israel to repent, told Israel to repent. He, you know, I'm going to read it in just a second, but I just want to throw this at you. Uh, do you. Do you remember the, the message of John the Baptist on his repent? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Not repent for your sins. Do you see the difference? Not repent for you, but repent for the kingdom is here. Repent. What does that mean? It means the Messiah is here. Repent. And he wasn't. <laughs> he's, you know, you got to change. You got to th think differently. Uh, the axe is at the root. And I'm going to read all that in just a second. But it's repent for the kingdom is here. Not repent because of your, of your sin. He told the religious system of, uh, of the wrath to come. Matthew 3, 7. John prophesied that the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Speaking of Judaism, John said, Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. John preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. John did not preach a kingdom thousands of years away. John did not preach repentance for sin. John said, Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did that mean? It meant the Messiah was at hand. Let's keep reading. John's message was the culmination message of all the prophets. Repent. Wrath to come and the kingdom. The natural Jew would not escape the acts of the Lord. Matthew 3, 9 and 10. Uh, it's better to try to understand these two witnesses if you look at them not as two individuals, but rather looking at them as two groups. Uh, two witnesses, not two people. The second witness would be the, the New Testament witnesses um, who prophesied the end of Moses and, and that Jesus is Christ and that Jesus is king. Now, just quickly, where was Stephen killed? Do you remember the story about Stephen? He was stoned. In Jerusalem? Where? Literally in the streets. Stoned, right? Sure he was. Uh, James, the brother of John, was killed. Herod killed him with a sword. He was going to kill Peter, 
But an angel came and helped Peter escape, rescued Peter. Remember that? We're going to read it in just a little while when we start look, reading some of Fox's books of martyrs. But, but James, brother, the, James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother half of Jesus, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was literally thrown off the temple and didn't die but was then hit in the head by a guy there and killed him right there in Jerusalem, right there in the streets. And, and so when you start looking, at the, you know, what, what John is saying is, is these people really died in the streets. And you've got the old, old covenant people and you've got the new covenant people and, and they're prophesying, all of them are prophesying about the destruction of, of Jerusalem. Uh, now, over on, on page 128, right column, come down uh, to Matthew 23, 37. And this is what Jesus said. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens unto her wings, and you would not. Now look at this. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So with, with that thought, with that thought, who do you really think that the witnesses would be that laid in the streets? Sure. Old covenant, new covenant. Old covenant prophets, new covenant prophets. All of them witnessed against, against, the, against Jerusalem and, and against Judaism. They died there. They literally did. Flip over to page 130. You can read this stuff. I'm just trying to... Uh, Keep it flowing and, 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 and keep our points moving. And let's read verse 7 of chapter 11. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast. Now this is the first mention of the beast. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. And shall overcome them and kill them. Now commentator after commentator after commentator says that the beast is the Antichrist. But interestingly, the word Antichrist is found how many times in the book of Revelation? <laughs> it's, it's not found. It's never used in the book of Revelation. Come down, if you will, uh, where the, right in the middle of, the, of that column where the paragraph begins with Antichrist is a major teaching. Antichrist is a major teaching of the dispensationalist. Rarely do we hear a dispensational teacher properly speak of Antichrist. They say Antichrist will come one day. The Bible says there are already many Antichrist. Here's your verse. It says, Who is a liar? No, that's the wrong one. Okay, here we go. Little children, it is the last time. John's saying it's the last day. When? 2000. <laughs> Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrist. Whereby we know it is the last time. See, it was the last time, the last day, 2,000 years ago, according to John. Back to your notes. Let's pick up the reading right where we left off. The Bible says they have been around since before the turn of the first century prior to AD 70. The dispensationalists say the Antichrist is a man who will rebuild the Roman Empire. The Bible says Antichrist is a system that denies that Jesus Christ is the Son and came in the flesh. Let me show you this. 1 John 2.22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Yeah. But in John's day, who denied that Jesus is the Christ? Pardon? The Antichrist? You got that? It's important. They denied it. They said, he's not. He's not. And we're going to kill him because he says he is. <laughs> Who's a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He hath 
He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. In other words, you think you're saved, but you're not saved. You think you have a relationship with Father, but you don't even know Father. And then 1 John 4, 2, and 4, yeah, 4, 2 and 4, 3. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges, acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. <laughs> and even now is already in the world. Back to your notes. Let's pick up reading again. In John's day, Antichrist was Judaism. It still is today, as is every belief system that denies Jesus is the Son, of Christ, uh, the Son and Christ who came in the flesh. But who is the beast? Okay, I just took a little detour there on Antichrist. But who, who is the beast? He says that this beast, you know, this guy, this, this beast. Who is the beast? What is the beast? Um, here's what Matthew Henry says, and if you look at that quote on the right column, about halfway down. Here's what Matthew Henry says, in his, and it's historically accurate. So he says, this beast was seven heads, seven mountains, the seven hills on which Rome stands, and seven kings, seven sorts of government. Five were gone by when this prophecy was written. One was then in being, and the other was yet to come. Let's keep reading. This beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit was the Roman Empire. Because of the clarity of the passage, Revelation 17, dispensational teaching must agree it is Rome. However, they say that a new Roman Empire will arise. This is to keep with their futuristic doctrine. They say this and at the same time say Jesus could come tomorrow with no Roman Empire in existence. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that? Have you, have you ever heard that Jesus can come any minute? Well, what about, what about the reestablishing of the Roman Empire? What about rebuilding that temple? Something's wrong. He can't come tomorrow if we've got to rebuild that temple and if we've got to reestablish the Roman Empire and if we've got to have a rapture. You know, we, he can't come. Good. Okay. How did they, why would they even think that way back then these people were predicting what was going to happen now? <laughs> I mean, That's, they, they, they call this prophecy. Know, they call this prophecy, you know. So they're, they're calling it a prophetic book. And, and in some dimensions, you know, it is. But as we've seen, it's a type of writing. It's basically apocalyptic writing, remember? See, it's, it's a form of writing. And it's not necessarily futuristic. It's not necessarily prophetic. It's apocalyptic. You're saying something, but you're saying it in, in apocalyptic. Right? <laughs> you're saying it in a different way. And it's just a form of writing. It's not just. It, it is a, it's, a, it's a fantastic way of, of saying things. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful. But anyway, let me keep reading here. Where am I? Uh, uh, so if you've heard of that, right? You've got to rebuild the temple and you've got to reestablish the Roman Empire, and, but yet it can come tomorrow. Does that make sense to you? That makes sense to me. I mean, you know, I mean it just, it just, none of it makes sense to me. It is so confusing to try to say, well, this is what's going to happen, and when nothing, none of it's ever happened. <laughs> Right? Well, I mean, that's, well, anyway. No, we will. <laughs> but the Roman, the Roman Empire historically did make war against them. And that's what the verse said, uh, that this beast uh, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit would make war against them. So the, 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 Antichrist, the beast, this, 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 not Antichrist, but the, this beast did make war with them, with, with, with Jerusalem. It did. Historically, it did. Rome warred against Israel and destroyed them in AD 70. But they also warred against Christians. I'm on page 131. 
Now, what I've got here are some quotes from Fox's Christian Martyrs of the World. And it's, there's many of them, and so we're not going to, we're not, you can read it, and again, you know, I'm just going to read two or three of them, just to show you what happened, and how, you know, Rome and, 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 the, and the Jews persecuted the Christians. But anyway, uh, let's come down here to, uh, on page 131, in the middle, where uh, it, the, the particular paragraph begins with Mark. Mark, the first bishop of Alexandria, this is Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, of Alexandria preached the gospel in Egypt, but yet he was burned and buried in a place named Bucalus during Trajan's reign. Now, that, the empire killed him. <laughs> Bartholomew is said to have preached in India and translated the gospel of Matthew into their tongue, but he was beaten and crucified and beheaded. Drop down... To James, I just want to read you this one about James, and, and this could be both Jew or, and probably one of the Jews that killed James, but anyway, let's, let's read this one. Uh, of James, the brother of the Lord, during Passover, the scribes and Pharisees put James on top of the temple, calling out to him, you just man, whom we all ought to obey, this people is going astray after Jesus, who was crucified. And James answered, why do you ask me of Jesus, the son of man? He sits on the right hand of the Most High and shall come in the clouds of heaven. Then went up and threw James off the temple. But James wasn't killed by the fall. But one of the men there, a fuller, took the instrument he used to beat cloth and hit James on the head, killing him. Drop down to uh, the next, well, not the next paragraph, but the next one that, where it says death was not considered Death was not considered enough punishment for the Christians who were subjected to the cruelest treatment possible. They were whipped, disemboweled, torn apart and stoned. Plates of hot iron were laid on them. They were strangled, eaten by wild animals, hung and tossed on the horns of bulls. Now this, this is the Romans doing this. After they were, that should be dead, not dead. After they were dead, <laughs> Their bodies were piled in heaps and left to rot without burial. Nevertheless, the church continued to grow deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and watered with the blood of the saints. So the beast did overcome them and the beast did kill them. But yet today those prophecies live. They still live. They were raised again. And those prophecies rise. Let's read uh, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8. And their dead bodies shall be in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, <laughs> where also our Lord was crucified. <laughs> wow, that's, that's just too clear, isn't it? That's just... Drop down to where I'm talking here in verses 8 through 11, that last paragraph on that page. And you've got to read this, okay? There is no doubt of the city to which John here refers. We know Jerusalem was where also our Lord was crucified. What we now learn is John, is John connects Jerusalem to Sodom and Egypt. There is no secret or covering of exactly what he means. He means both Sodom and Egypt were judged of God. Egypt was judged by plagues, plunder, death of the firstborn, and destruction of their army. Egypt was laid desolate. Sodom was laid desolate by hellfire and brimstone, so much so that it cannot be found. The Lord God destroyed both. This is what happened to the great city where our Lord was crucified. Is that pretty clear? I mean, it just, I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, it just gets clearer and clearer, doesn't it? Once, once you start opening up to it and understanding where it's going and how it's going and get, and get kind of focused, it, it becomes quite clear what the book of Revelation really is about. Now look at page uh, 133. And again, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've already said a lot of the stuff that's in there, but maybe you want to read it, and, 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 and please do. Now, <clears throat> John comes to a place in verse 14. And he's talking here, he says, uh, I'm on the left column, I'm just going to read this, verse 14, and then I'm going to jump across on the other column. Uh, in in uh, Revelation 11:14, 14, he says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. 
Now go, go over and look at get, get verse 15, the next verse. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, I, I, I want to make sure we, we link what I'm trying to say here. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe comes, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the, the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Is, is that a woe to you? That the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Christ and of his Lord. Is that a woe to you? That Jesus is king and Lord? And that the nations are now subject to him? It's, it's not a woe to me. But would it be a woe to the Jews? <laughs> Why? Because he said, I'm coming on a cloud. <laughs> this place is going to be de-stoned. De you know, it's coming apart. Um, and, and the nations, he says, you know, the, the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms. It's a woe to the kingdoms that reject Jesus. It, it, it is. It, it is today. I mean, you look at him, you look at the countries and the nations who have received Jesus Christ as king and Lord, and you see the blessings on them. But then you look at these countries that reject him. It's a woe to them. Now, they might not realize it, but it is. That's, that's why they're in, this, in the situations they are. It's not a woe to me, but it was a woe to Judaism. Come down to verse 18 there. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. Um, it says the nations were angry. Have you ever thought about why nations hate Jesus? <laughs> nations hate Jesus Christ. And they hate him with a passion. Why is it that uh, people use the name of Christ or Jesus in profanity, but you never hear, their, hear them use Buddha <laughs> or Muhammad in, in, in profanity? <laughs> Why are Christians hated so much? You see, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. Uh, no other belief or no other religion declares that its founder is king and lord of nations. No, no other belief system says that our God reigns. You know, no other belief system says our king is going, our God is going to rule you <laughs> with a rod of iron. I think, I think that's probably why they hate us. We have a message of a king who's taken over. And, 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 it's, and it's that way. I mean, again, look at the nations who have, re have received Jesus Christ, and you see blessed countries. And the nations that have rejected him. It's a rod of iron. The nations hate him, and they are angry. And that's what we proclaim. You know, our God reigns. <laughs> the kingdoms of this world are now today the kingdoms of our Lord. Now, uh, I want to look at a few translations here of that verse and see this in a present tense. And you'll get my thrust here when I, when I finish up. But uh, the King James Version says in Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become, are become, not will become, but are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The NIV version says it this way. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And <laughs> I was going to say, what? <laughs> and the New Living Translation says... Uh, New Living Translation, not New Living Bible, but the New Living Translation. This is really a translation, you know. Uh, it says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, The whole world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, 
Of course, the dispensationalists say this is something that's going to happen in the future. So here's my point. My point here is that if this has taken place, if Jesus has received a kingdom at his ascension, if Jesus received the kingdom at his ascension, then we are now in a kingdom. We're not waiting for a kingdom to come. If Jesus received a kingdom, and it has now become the kingdom of our Christ and his Lord, then we are now in that kingdom. Uh, they have become. But if this is yet to happen, then Jesus is yet to become king. Or he's a king without a kingdom. And he means nothing. It, Am, am I on track here? Do, do, you, you, you get my point. See, either he is or he isn't. He can't be a king in waiting. He is king. And he is Lord. And we are in the kingdom. And I so want people to hear, you know, don't miss the kingdom. Don't miss the greatest thing that's ever happened in the world. Don't miss the kingdom by a doctrine. Don't allow a dispensational doctrine to cause you to miss the goodness of the kingdom of God. You know, I, I just, my mind just went, went to this morning's lesson in Matthew 4, 23, and it says that Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. You know, there's the three aspects of the kingdom. And so many people lose their healing. They never get that miracle of healing because the doctrine they listen to says there's not a kingdom yet. See, the way Jesus communicated the kingdom was by preaching and teaching and healing. I like that. I like that. I, I like the point that it's as important to heal people as it is to preach to people. It's as important to heal people as it is to teach people. You know, the last of our service this morning was just as important as the first. And I love it. You know, I love that thought. That was just a real, woo, I like that one. <laughs> but he's not a king without a kingdom, is he? He is our king and our Lord. We sing that stuff. Everybody sings that stuff. But yet and still they're waiting for him to come one day. Oh, man, he is king. <laughs> he is Lord. All righty. Uh, page 135. Let's kind of wind this up for this session. Look at verse 19 with me in the left column. Page 135. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Now, how could they see the ark? Uh-oh. With the veil in front of it. The temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Huh. Uh, see, dispensationalist. And the, and the teachings and the doctrines that we've most heard do not believe um, that this is a reference to Herod's temple or to the temple that, uh, that, that Jesus said would be destoned you know, and destroyed. They don't think that this is a futuristic temple. It was a temple uh, that would be rebuilt, not the temple that Jesus said would be tread underfoot. Though we know it happened, and though we see it throughout the book of Revelation, dispensational teachers say that this really isn't a reference to that temple, it's going to be another temple. So I want to work here just a little bit. Uh, this temple, read with me uh, on, on right column 135, uh, the quote there that I've got, this temple is not Herod's temple. This is a quote from Dake, Phineas J. Dake, the anointed Bible guy. This temple is not Herod's temple, he says. 
For that one was destroyed some 25 years before the vision of the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 A.D. In other words, what he's saying is that John didn't write this until A.D. 95. Again, the temple cannot be the millennial temple. Now, now we've got already two temples. We've got the temple that was destroyed in A.D. 70. Now we've got the millennial temple. It cannot be the millennial temple as described in Ezekiel 40 through 48 because that will not be built until Christ comes to earth, Zechariah 6, 12. The temple here is the one to be rebuilt by the Jews. It's the third temple. The temple here is to be rebuilt by the Jews before Daniel's 70th week. In other words, before the Great Tribulation. It's supposed to be built before the Great Tribulation. So, well, let me, let me work here. It will be destroyed at the end of the tribulation, either by an earthquake under the seventh seal or by the armies of the Antichrist at the taking of Jerusalem. Now, <laughs> now, let me see if I can make some sense of the doctrine. I can't make sense of it, but maybe I can try to explain to you uh, their doctrine. Okay, we've got Daniel's 70th week, which is the seven years of great tribulation. We talked about that in here. All right, now before this seven, seven, uh, Daniel 70th week or the seven years of great tribulation, there's going to be a rapture. This is their doctrine. It's going to be a rapture. And then the Jewish temple will be rebuilt. And during these seven years, the, the Jewish temple, the mosque over in, in Jerusalem will be removed. And the Jewish temple will be rebuilt in, in, that, in that time period. It's going to be rebuilt. And that then will reestablish the law of Moses. Now that doesn't sound too bad if you say it real quick. You know. What that means is we reinstitute animal sacrifices, blood sacrifices. But we've just talked about we're going to tread down the outer court, right? You know what we've been talking about and it's going to be tread underfoot. But they're going to reinstitute it and they're going to rebuild the altars and the, the labor bowls and all this stuff and they're going to bring back animal sacrifices, which is saying that the blood of Jesus is insufficient. People will now be saved by, again, by animal sacrifices. And another important part of reinstituting of the law of Moses is circumcision. Your grandchildren and your children will need to be circumcised. Which is a doctrine that the Apostle Paul detested. Uh, <laughs> and then... This is all going on, and then at the end of that seven, year of great, seven years of great tribulation, there's going to be a massive earthquake, or either the armies of the Antichrist will destroy that temple. And then after that has ha happened, and Jesus comes back to earth again, he's going to rebuild another temple. <laughs> this, is, I mean, this is what they teach. People don't know that's what... They teach. They don't know that's what they believe. But this is what the rapture and the tribulation and all this stuff and the thousand year millennial reign and all, all that's what all this is about. And so Jesus comes back and he builds another temple. <laughs> now this is the one that Ezekiel talks about in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. And this is the millennial reign temple. <laughs> However, again, according to Ezekiel, this temple will do animal sacrifices. With Jesus on the throne, they're going to do animal sacrifices. Now, let me show you. I just want to show you. Just, I mean, you can, you can read Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, and you can see it for yourself. But I just, I just, I got to find my place again. <coughs> but here is right in the middle of Ezekiel chapters 40 through chapters 48, right? Well, 43, 18 is what I'm going to read. And there's, there's, there's a bunch. But just, just to read, read you this, this one uh, from Ezekiel. Uh, just to show you that they will be doing animal sacrifices with Jesus sitting there on the throne. Uh, it says this. Then he said to me, son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says. These will be the regulations for the sacrificing burnt offerings and sprinkling blood upon the altar when it is built. <laughs> you are to give a young bull as a sin offering to the priest. See, not only do we reinstitute animal sacrifice, we reinstitute the Levitical priesthood. To the priest, who are Levites of the family of Zadok, 
who come near to minister before me, declares the sovereign Lord. Now, now to me, this is not what's going to happen. We are not going to reinstitute blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices. We are not going to reinstitute the Levitical priesthood. <coughs> to me, this is a bad, bad teaching. To me, this is not what this is talking about in, the chap in chapter 11, that where we look into heaven and we see a temple and we see the ark. Now, what is it then talking about? What is the Bible saying that we look and we see, you know, this ark? Uh, let me ask you, does, does the Bible tell us anywhere anything like that? Yeah, it does. You know it does. You just think a minute. Does it tell us any place that the veil was rent and removed? And what does that mean? You say that's exactly. Matthew 27, 51 says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Lightnings and thunders and earthquakes. And all of a sudden you can look and you can see the Ark of the Covenant. See, what, what happened when Jesus died and that veil was rent, that simply makes a statement that no longer is there a partition between God and man. No longer do we have to go through Levitical priests. No longer do we have to do animal sacrifices. No longer. The blood of Jesus Christ is made away. The book of Hebrews says that the veil was his flesh. And it was rent. It was torn. So that you and I can have access to God. And we can now come boldly before the throne of grace. To find grace and mercy in a time of need. You see, this is, this is what John's saying here in this chapter. The Levitical system is done away with. It's trodden under the foot. That whole outer court blood system is trodden under the foot by the Gentiles. Until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now what we can see is we can look straight through into pure worship. Into worship at the altar of incense. Where worship is pure. And is worship in spirit and truth. Where we can now have access to the holy, of, holy places. To the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the whole earth. That's what the Bible's about. That's what the book of Revelation's about. It's all about hooking up God and man. It's all about you and I having a way to him where there was no way. We had to have a priest and we had to have a cow or a bull or a goat. No longer, John says. No longer. The veil's rent. And now we have access. So the veil was rent, wasn't it? And behind the veil is the ark. So what was the symbolism of the veil being rent? The doing away with that outer court. The doing away with all of that stuff. No more law. All that's been removed. No more temple worship. So anything that Ezekiel, that they say Ezekiel is wanting to project here about some other temple being built, I just can't buy into it. I can't see it. I can't see it at all. I think that is a very, very bad teaching. <laughs> Amen? Is that pretty clear? It's pretty clear, isn't it, when you kind of get, get on focus and get online with it and all that stuff. Well, let's pray.